For today, what we're going to be talking about is using uh, braces and TADS. So we're going to be going through some information on this. So this is my contact information. Um, so if you have any questions or any, um, you know, any comments or any other concerns after the lecture and you want to reach out to me, you're more than welcome to uh, reach out to me by reaching at my office or my email uh, at the office or uh, calling us at the office. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, you know, braces, is there more than just teeth movement? So we're just going to be looking at, you know, traditional orthodontics by moving your teeth. Uh, but also what we want to do is, is there something more that we can do uh, to allow the patient um, to have straight teeth, but possibly without extracting teeth? The next thing we want to talk about is uh, TADS and then how we use TADS to stop unwanted tooth movement. Um, this has been a game changer for me and my practice in terms of being able to um, help my patients out to be able to control certain movement that was not possible um, without using these TADS. So the only thing that that the only thing that prevents me from my learning is my education. Albert Einstein said this. So, and what that means is that I am a general dentist, but I actually started my journey down this path of doing the orthodontics and orthopedics. But it actually started with me um, doing TMJ treatment for my uh, for my patients. Initially, what happened was when I first started to do treatment, what would happen is, is that I find that a lot of patients had a lot of head and neck facial pain. Um, and then what we found is that there's a lot of patients that had underdeveloped jaws or narrow jaws. Um, and then so from that point forward, we tried to figure out a way that is there a way that we can prevent this or sort of mitigate these issues that patients are having as adults, um, but also as, for, for example, when they're teenagers or kids. So from that point Forward, I ended up moving forward to learn about, uh, you know, myofascial trigger points, uh, TMJ treatment, and along with that, I ended up getting uh, to the point where I'm able to treat and learn, uh, sorry, treat patients uh, to be able to mitigate all these issues later on. So the greatest obstacle to progress is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. So there's certain things and certain ideas that were taught in school that may not be the truth or may not be what's scientifically found right now. It's more of common knowledge, but sometimes it's sort of ideas then passed down from generation to generation from teacher to student. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't have any merit when you're starting to look at the science behind it. So bone is affected by function and light intermittent forces. And this is something where this concept we use consistently in orthodontics is by applying a certain amount of force on a tooth. And when you move the tooth with a certain amount of force, you can move it in a certain direction. But also what happens is you have to look at the duration of the force and also the intensity of the force. You have to also keep that in mind. So if you apply in a certain manner, you're, you're able to get certain amazing movements. <clears throat> this is one case of mine that I have with a patient of mine where you can see on her uh, left-hand side, she has a a crossbite where the entire right side of the maxilla is stuck inside of the mandible. And you can see that um, completely where the X is showing. But also where you see in the face picture, you can see that her eyes and that part of the jaw is dropped down compared to the, uh, the parallel ground when you're looking at it, right? The horizontal. So now once we develop the jawbone and started bringing it out, you can actually start seeing that there's really good changes. So not only in the teeth that you can see the changes, you can see how the, the teeth start to come out on the right-hand side and over the lower teeth, but you can actually start to see changes in the face too. So our body is an amazing dynamic system. So stuff that we do in the mouth can have a overall global effect on the patient themselves. So you can see that this is very obvious. As we started to develop the, the right-hand side out, we can start getting changes in the face. Typically, you will see this when uh, patients are usually younger and adults, it's not as common, um, but, you know, but you can still get these type of changes. So what we wanna look out for is, you, you're looking for is the actual ocular plane. So you're looking at the level of the eyes, the ears, 
and the maxilla. So sometimes the eyes and the ears and the maxilla, if they're canted, then that causes different stress systems on the head and neck system. So you can see that that's happened here. So bone is affected by function. And you can see how with the little one here, this baby has a tongue tie, but by simply releasing the tongue tie, you can see on the left, it's stuck. And then on the right video, you can see that the baby after the tongue tie release is able to lift the tongue. The tongue is actually an amazing uh, generator for the upper maxilla to grow. So if one, as their babies or infants, if the tongue is tied down and it stays low, the baby cannot lift the tongue up into the maxilla. If the baby cannot lift the tongue into the maxilla when they're eating and swallowing, they're not able to stimulate the maxilla and make it develop. And that's where you can get an underdevelopment of the upper jaw. So this is sort of later on where it is another child when you're looking at it, but now you're seeing it's a narrow jaw, tongue thrust. So you can see when the child is swallowing, you can see how the tongue is sticking out in between the teeth. And then you can see also the eye plane, the eyes and the face, you can see that it's off also. And you can see here in the middle video that the jaw, when she centered her jaw out bilaterally, both sides of the maxilla is very narrow. So what it is, it's so constricted on the maxilla that the teeth are teetering on each other. So it has to shift either to the right or left and she's open in the front. But once she lines up the front teeth in the middle, you can see that in the midline, when she lines up, the maxilla is bilaterally narrow. So she doesn't have a unilateral crossbite. It's actually a bilateral crossbite. Another way that you can affect the bone besides the tongue, tongue is thumb sucking, for example. So with that, that can also affect the shape of the maxilla and the mandible. So this is another case of ours that we had, that a patient had that. And you can see that the maxilla is very, very, very restricted and very underdeveloped. And then you can see that he has a large overjet. Now, what we can do is try to retrain the swallowing by using tongue tamers. So there's little spiky things that we can put on the back of the teeth to help retrain the tongue. We also use a TPA, which is a wire that goes across the molar area that allows the patient to swallow their swallow by keeping their tongue on the actual tongue tamer or the omega loop. Um, and then what we do is we give patients swallowing exercises. So we wanna actually retrain the initial swallowing issue. Because patients have narrow, narrow jaws or crowded jaws, and then the teeth are crowded, it's not, it may not be because just the teeth want to be crowded, it's because usually because there's some sort of abnormal uh, function that the patient has, and the swallowing is a big one. So now this is another version that we have for the um, maxilla, and this patient, what we've done is that we've de we're developing the jaw, but at the same time, you can see the little prongs and the ball on the left video that help with the swallowing and the little prongs also prevent the tongue from coming forward. This is a patient of mine that had a thumb, uh, thumb sucking habit up into the age of about 23, 24. So, so this is an adult patient that we had that we treated non-surgically. And you can see that there's a lot of changes in the jawbone shape of it being square and narrow to being nice and broad and U-shaped. So this patient had multiple consultations saying that the only way to treat her as an adult was surgical. And in this case, we were able to treat non-surgically and got a great result without having to do any orthognathic surgery for her. 
Also, what, uh, mouth breathing and large tonsils can affect the jaw and facial development. So large tonsils and adenoids can be an issue for the patient. So we want to make sure that we look at that airway also to make sure that that's not creating a problem for the patient to breathe, which in, inadvertently mm. will affect how the tongue postures, which also will affect how the jaw develops. So you can see how here in the left picture that the jaw is very underdeveloped, the canines are blocked out, and then he has large tonsils and adenoids. So this case typically would be like a bicuspid extraction case, but what we were able to do is we were able to develop the jaw and make it wider and longer to be able to uh, get a nice broad smile. So we went from here to here. And that's without removing a single tooth. Also, the child got his tonsils and adenoids removed at the same time so that it can allow for his breathing to be improved. So when we're looking at the orthodontic paradigm shift, right? Dynamic bone loading causes bone deformation. So what I mean by that is that if you're able to put a certain amount of force in the right direction, it will cause the bone to move. There are certain... Um, conditions, genetic disorders where pa or birth defects that patients are born with, where they lose part of the maxilla in the front where it develops. So the maxilla is made of three bones, two in the back, one in the front. So if it doesn't fuse in the front, for example, you can see in the picture in the middle that the eye droops. But that's kind of like this patient that she doesn't have a, in, um, a birth defect in the premaxilla, but what she does have is the eye tooth is completely blocked out in that place. Because it's blocked out, that means that this part of the premaxilla is underdeveloped. If it's underdeveloped, it shows up in her face being, with the eyes being down on that side. So I already showed you this video of her development there. But what we were able to do is we we're able to develop and expand the jawbone, also use braces at the same time, but, all, but we did develop the bone. And this is sort of the sequence that we went through. So as we progress throughout the procedure, we're able to get the right side out and then start leveling the teeth and aligning the teeth. And we ended up with a pretty good result because this case, as a older teenager, the only option she was given was surgical. So in terms of us finishing with this without surgery, she's very happy with the results. So same thing here. There's the eye tooth blocked out where the X is. You can see that right here in the screen. And then from there, as we developed and we created room, we're able to get the eye tooth in position. And then so that allowed us to go from there to there. And this is the sequencing. We created the room to open. The cuspid was exposed, brought into the arch wire sequence, and then the occlusion was finalized. So our traditional orthodontic theory when we're looking at is pressure and tension, where you're pushing on one side and pulling on the other side. Um, and then this is sort of the traditional thought. But a lot of the more progressive orthodontists now that are looking at it, they are starting to say that, hey, there's a new paradigm. And they're saying that there's a lot of misconceptions that the bone itself is immutable, which means that you cannot change it, which is not true. It also says the position of the lower teeth, exactly they want a certain angulation of the position that you look for in the x-rays. They say that if you have it at that angle, then you're guaranteed therapeutic stability, which is not true either. And then bone cannot be therapeutically grown on a flat surface which means that you can't, if you're moving the teeth outwards, the bone on the outside of the teeth cannot be grown, which is not true either. So what happens is this, is that this is actually a, um, a uh, slide that was given to me by a periodontist specialist uh, down in South America. The orth this tooth got, had to be, this tooth was tipped inadvertently buckly too far by mistake. And because the patient was lost out of the system. Finally, when the patient came back, the tooth wasn't able to be kept. When they did take the tooth out, this is what they saw. And they're able to see that even though the tooth was tipped out buckly, really, really far out, almost double the width outwards, you can see that there's still bone all the way on the facial side. 
So that's pretty amazing to see that, you know, the bone will travel with the tooth if it's a light intermittent force. So what we're looking at is this is that we want to make sure that when we're putting in a certain amount of pressure, that we put the pressure so that we stay, which is a micro strain. So we put a certain amount of force. That force, we want to be able to keep it in the range where the resorption, which means that taking away bone is slower than adding bone, forming. So what we want to do is we want to put a light constant force to be able to create more bone than bone is being taken away. So that's the idea of what we want to do with light, light forces. And then, so that's where we're staying in this realm of, we put light intermittent forces where you see on the bottom where it says daily loading. So the more you can load it by chewing and functioning, biting and putting a light stimulation with a nickel titanium appliance in the mouth, right? The micro strain, it allows you to form bone. There's a histological side and that you can see on the outside here that in the yellow section right here that there's actual bone being formed on the surface of the tooth, on the, on the flat surface, there's actual bone being formed. So it does happen. So there is a famous orthodontist and uh, Dr. McNamara and they did a study and this is back in the seventies. And what they looked at is that they looked at the tooth size and the jaw size. And what they found was that the dental volume, the, the actual arch size in the crowded group had a smaller jawbone compared to the people that had no crowding. So the uncrowded group had the same CSI teeth, but the only difference was that in the uncrowded group or the non-crowded group, their bone was bigger compared to the ones that had crowding, they had a smaller bone, but the same tooth size. So what they suggested was, is that they want, you should be using a technique to increase the dental arch length, which is the bone volume, rather than reduce the tooth mass, which is taking teeth out. So this is a, tad, uh, this is a patient, a TMD patient. What we're looking at is that, do we make the bone bigger or extract the premolars? So with this patient of ours that we had, you can see that she has a lot of crowding here, right? And then typically this could have been a bicuspid extraction case where you take out the fir first bicuspids on the top. And then after that, once you've taken out the first bicuspids out here and here, you can retract the canines back to create room and then take out the bicuspids here and then to create room and then pull these back. What we did was actually we did the opposite. We wanted and we actually developed the jawbone to make it bigger. So I'm going to show you that next. So we used a RN sagittal, which is a light nickel titanium force appliance. And we had acrylic on it that acted like almost like a TMJ splint at the same time. So we're able to try to stabilize the jaw joint along with the bite and we could develop the jaw bone. On the lower, we put a lower alpha pliant scent to develop the lower jaw bone so that we can make it bigger too. So now you can see that when you're looking at it, there's a difference in terms of the shape uh, of the actual jaw bone itself. So when you're looking at the bottom diagram or the bottom picture here, Right in here, you can see that there's a lot of crowding. But now in this picture, you can see that it's more of a U shape, the actual jawbone. And in here, it looks more like a rectangle shape. And you can see on the bottom, it's starting to round out. Also, you can see that the crowding is starting to become eliminated also. So I'll
And then, uh, so from here, you can see that before and after. So the befores are in the smaller pictures on the corners. And you can see how the jaw shape has changed. And then now with the appliance out, you can see that how the jaw upper maxilla has changed its shape where it's more of a U shape versus more of a square boxy shape. And we didn't remove any teeth. So then now we put the braces on the back teeth and then we continued on with the treatment. And we continued to develop the jawbone. We used elastics also to help start to bring her teeth together. And we're using elastics to, in a certain manner, we usually use triangular elastics in the front to bring the eye teeth so the eye teeth touch together. So we get canine guidance. So the eye teeth support the back teeth so they don't bump too much. And then, so now you can see from here with the elastics, we get a better improvement in the bite. She did have a little bit of minor rotation in the lower central incisor. So we used a power chain to help untwist the tooth. So this is now two months prior to us taking the braces off. What we do is we take out the top wire and let the upper teeth settle against the lower to make sure that the function is good. If like how we talked about earlier today was the tongue thrust, if the patient still has a tongue thrust and they're still swallowing with the tongue coming out, at, what will happen is the teeth will start to shift and you start seeing that. So you know ahead of time, before you take all the braces off that the patient has a tongue thrust. So you have to go back in to make sure that they get it under control. And so this is a good way to test for that. And now you can see how the patient, when she's opening and closing, the jaw is opening pretty smoothly. And then you can see how you have nice U-shaped jaws and she's very comfortable. So you can see there's a lot of big, big changes. We usually have a box of Kleenex in our room with these type of patients because, you know, it's very emotional when you start removing the braces and, you know, it comes to a final end when they're starting to feel better. Um, their headaches, jaw pain, TMJ is better, but then also in terms of being able to have a nice smile. It's really rewarding to be able to help patients like this. So we went from here initially to here is the final result. So you can see that there's a nice change in the jaw size without having to remove any teeth. And also our function is really good. So these are the before and after when she's in a retainer, before and after. And you can see how the deep bite is gone. The teeth don't no longer are hiding. Nice big broad smile. Case two, same thing what we're looking at. So very deep bite, completely 100% overbite. So all the teeth are completely hidden, right? And when we're looking at this case here, also a TMJ patient of mine, very deep bite. The front teeth are retroclined, so it's a class two, div two situation. And then so what we did was that instead of trying to take teeth out to create room here, uh, what we did is that we were able to open up the bite by resetting the position of the jaw. We used an appliance just like the similar to the other case that I showed you by putting a little ramp in the front. And that ramp in the front 
allows the patient when they bite, bite down to be held open. So what it does is this ramp piece right here is situated right in here. So when the patient is biting down into it, so if that's, that's the upper teeth, the ramp sits like this on the inside. So the lower teeth sit right on top of it and they rest. And then what happens is in the back teeth here and here, there's a space that's left behind. And then you can bring the teeth together to close that space. So we went from there to there. And then from that point forward, now you can see that the jaw shape is starting to change, becoming more broad. And the bottom also, we're starting to see that there's some changes that are starting. And then from there, we're able to start using elastics up and down so that we can start bringing the bite together. So it allows the teeth to start touching in the back. So you can see right here bilaterally. So elastics are worn here and elastics are worn here in the back to bring the bite together. And then from there, we put braces on the back area to start finishing up the bite. So, as you can see now that the back teeth are completely touching now, this is still in mid-treatment. But you can see that we're starting to get contact. Now from there, we're able to bring the bite together. She had a tongue tie, so we talked about this as the swallowing is another thing that we got to look at. So we actually had to do a lingual phrenectomy, so we had to release the tongue tie. Hopefully nobody's squeamish with a little bit of blood, but we're going to see a little bit of that. But you can see that that tongue tie here has been released. So we're able to cut it and release the tongue tie itself and then stitch it together. So it looks like almost nothing happened, and this is right after the surgery. But what it allows that tongue to do is allows it to lift up. So instead of the tongue, the tongue should be able to lift from the base all the way up. But what happens is if it's bound down, it gets stuck. So what happens is you're releasing all this muscle that's binding it, almost like Velcro, you can think of it. And you're just releasing the Velcro off. And then when you stitch it together, then the tongue can't stick back. So the tongue can lift up and down properly. And the patient's able to swallow better. So this is just prior to us taking the braces off, let the bite settle in. So she was really happy with this in terms of the results. So we were able to get a really good result, open up her bite, give her better aesthetics and a better function. So you can see the nice changes. So in the shape of the jaw changes, you can see how the curve of the jaw, the curvature starts to flatten out as we open the bite. And you can see here in these pictures that it doesn't look as curved and deep from the front, it's flatter. And then from the side, same thing. You can see how there's not a big curve in the bite. So she was really happy with that result. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be talking about TADS. And then, so from this point forward, what we wanna do is TADS can be used for several reasons, right? We're gonna to touch on a few. So one is for intrusion, which means that you can pu push the teeth back up into the bone. So in the maxilla, you can push them up or in the mandible, you can push them down into the bone. So sometimes if you have a missing molar 
on the bottom, for example, and the upper molar has nothing to bite against, you'll see that molar start to grow down. And then now when the patient comes in, you're trying to make a denture, for example, on the bottom, that tooth on the top is in the way. So instead of taking the tooth out, for example, or not being able to make a denture that's proper, what you can do is take two tads and put them into the jawbone on the top and push the tooth back into the bone and then create that space that you need for your denture, for example, or your bridge or implant. Burning anchorage is that when you make a lot of space as you develop the jawbone and make it nice and big and broad, what will happen is that you have a lot of spaces. So you can use implants to put them in and then pull everything forward. Distalization, so sometimes you have a lot of crowding in the front and you need to pull the teeth back, right, to create room. So then you can also put tads towards the back and be able to pull the teeth towards the back. You can correct midline discrepancy. So sometimes when the patient's biting, you can see that the upper teeth are not in line with the face and they're completely off, right? So if you wanna pull them over, it's hard to sort of pull shuffle tooth by tooth, one by one. So you can use tads in that case to help with that type of movement. The correcting occlusal can't. So sometimes the maxilla or the mandibles on a slant, you can use tads on one side. For example, if it's down like this, the maxilla is hanging down. You can put tads on this side to be able to pull that up. Also, if somebody has a really gummy smile and they're smiling, you show a lot of gum, you could put three or four tads on the top and be able to pull and intrude the entire maxilla and pull it up to get rid of the gummy smile also. Okay, erupting ectopic teeth. So what happens is that sometimes you'll have a canine tooth stuck in the palate and it's in a weird position. And, you and the way that you wanna to try to pull it down, sometimes you can't get an elastic onto the teeth properly to pull it down in the right direction that you want. So you can use a tad independently, put it in the palate and put a nickel titanium wire off of it and use it almost like a fishing hook. So you're able to have the tad anchored and you have the wire hanging off of it and you bend it where you want and pull it down, glue it to the tooth. And what happens is then it will want to rebound up. So you're able to get that movement that you're looking for in a very controlled manner. Also what happens and is super common is that the lower molars, like for example, if you have your first molars that have been taken out and extracted, what will happen is, is that the second molars, for example, will lean forward into that space. Or if you have a bicuspid missing, the first molar will lean in like this. So now in order to straighten it out or uprighting it, you can use TADS for that very easily. So when you're looking at placement of TADs, right? You're looking for good bone to be, uh, for, for the TAD actual placement itself, right? So in the maxilla and the upper jaw, you can use it to put it into the palate. So that's one place that can be used. The other one is on the buckle aspect of the uh, maxilla. The also on the lingual side can be used on the maxilla. The infrazygomatic arch, which is kind of right by the first molar region. In the mandible, you can use it in the buccal shell. So that's where the second molar area is, but just right beside it, there's a nice thick ledge of bone there. So you can use that to actually anchor your tad into. That retromolar pad area, which is right behind where the wisdom tooth area is, that can be used also. The ramus, which is the back part of the jaw um, above, behind and above where the wisdom tooth is, that can be used also. And also the buccal aspect of the lower uh, mandible can be used in between the roots and also on the lingual side on the mandible. So when we're using placing TADS, right, there's an armamentarium that we use. And so what we're going to be doing is, is that we have a TAD pilot drill. And this is our TAD kit that we use that has everything in it. So we have a pilot drill, we have a guide drill that places the, uh, that's used on a contra angle. You have a Thomas screwdriver. You have the applicator, which allows you to carry the TAD to the site 
and actually torque it in, which means that you can screw it in with a certain amount of strength, almost like when you're tightening the nuts on, on your tire on your car, you have to torque it. So the same thing is you insert the tad when you're turning and twisting it, that pressure that you're using is called torque. So that's being used and you can put it at a certain setting, which you use is around 10 Newton centimeters. So the tad um, torque wrench will allow us to do that. So this is done on Typodon, just a demo, how it can be placed in. There's different parameters that we will use. Um, don't need to go into the details today, but it's just to give you a general idea. So you can see that you're trying to aim for the tad to be placed in between the roots and not hit the roots themselves. Um, there's certain parameters that we're looking for and I'll just give you generally, but what we're looking for is, is that if we're placing them on the buckle aspect of the maxilla or mandible, you want to make sure that they are in between the roots of the teeth. So you could take an x-ray to see how much space is between the two roots. And you want, uh, you know, you want a minimum distance of 3.6 millimeters in between. So between the two roots, so that when you're putting the tad in, you don't end up bumping against the root and damaging them. Also, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the bone thickness uh, or the crust, uh, the cortical bone you're looking at is at least about 0.5 to one millimeter thick. So in the thicker the cortical plate, the better the implant will stay in, in terms of stability wise. In order to put it on the buckle aspect, you want it at least four millimeters down from the bone height down, you want to place it four millimeters away. Now, this is a case where we did uh, a tad placement on the palate. And it's a really interesting case because it's a class three case where she has a, as an adult, she had treatment when she was done younger and she had bicuspids extractions, but everything was retracted back in a class three. Her bottom jaw, because it's a class three, genetically wants to continue to grow to a certain predetermined length. So what happened is, is that as she's growing, the mandible, you can see that the lower teeth start to lean back as the jaw was growing out from underneath. And you can see that in the picture on the left-hand side here. Okay, so now what we're doing is on the palate, we're looking for the best area to place the tad. And the best place to place it is between the contact point between the eye tooth and the premolar and the first premolar and second premolar. So that's where the yellow, you see the yellow line is. So that's where from occlusally, that's where you want to be. And then so now what happens is that bone thickness also is a really favorable thickness between 1.14 to about 1.5 millimeter. So it's nice, good thickness. So it allows you to place a nice stable implant into that area. Now also, the closer you are to the midline of the middle of the jawbone on the palate, the thicker, the more dense the bone is. So when you start looking at it, two, four, six millimeters away from the mid palate is a very good area to place all of them. And it provides a really good stability for the tad. So, and also the greatest bone height is in the same region. So when you're putting the tad in, what you have to make sure is that when you're placing it, it doesn't go into the floor of the nose. 
So you have to be really, really careful of that. So when you're looking here, so this region, ML, ML1 and ML2, if you're looking at it here, when I put the TAD in, in that region, ML1 and ML2, we're putting it in here or here, this is the floor of the nose. So the nose is sitting out over here like this. So, and this is the nasal cavity right in here. So what you want to be careful is that when you're putting the TAD in this location here, between here and here, the TAD doesn't inadvertently go into the, into the nose itself. So this area where I'm showing you of ML1, ML2, and two to six millimeters, this region right here is a very safe region to place a six millimeter diameter implant, uh, sorry, six millimeter length implant without perforating and going into the nose. Okay, so we can come back to this. Sorry. Now, so she was a previous bicuspid extraction case. Also, she had a lot of jaw compression and a lot of jaw issues she's complaining about too. So she can see that she had teeth removed on the uppers and on the lowers. And so what we're looking at it here from the skeletal point is that you can see that the mandible is further out than the maxilla. So there's the maxillary teeth in the maxilla. There's your A point right there, which is the deepest concavity in the maxilla. But if you look at the mandible, there's B point right here. So if you look at B point right here, an A point, you can see skeletally that A point is further back than B point. So the skeletal overjet is a class three, right? But the lower teeth have compensated by tipping back to compensate for that. So we did an x-ray analysis and that confirms our findings that we're talking about. So we'll go into too much details with this. But one thing interesting that you can see is that when we did her MRIs for her TMJ joints, you can see from a coronal cut from the front side, if you cut like an orange and look at it from the front side, you can see that the jaw joint, the disc is actually stuck inward so you can see this bulge almost like almost like a teardrop towards the side so the head instead of the disc being on top like this it's stuck sideways and bulged out this way so you can see that in the mri here and that's where i'm pointing with my mouse on the right side you're seeing the same thing that there's a bulge so on her right joint Right, the disc has slipped inwards and you see the bulge and it's facing inward. So they're both medially displaced. And then the front sagittal cut. So if I take you as an orange and cut you from the front and look from the side, then what you can see that there's basically no disc sitting above the head, above the joint right in here. So that is, and I'll give you as a reference, there's your ear, that's the back of your head, your eyeballs are out here in front, your nose, mouth is out here, so that's, you're looking away from the side view, there's the jaw joint right here, the upper lower jaw, the, the condyle, there's the articular eminence, and then the disc actually technically should be in here like this, but it's not. And then also in the other MRI cut, you can see these bright white signals. You see where the mouse is pointing. That bright white shows up as joint 
effusion, which is swelling in the joint. So the joint is swollen up. So that's why patients may complain of pain when they open and close because the joint is swollen, just like your knee or your elbow. If you twist it or tweak it, it gets swollen. It's hard to move. It's the same idea. So what we did was that we used an upper appliance to allow to develop the maxilla forward to bring it out to decompress the lower. So we're able to create some space. And so you can see from the video here that we got a good amount of overjet. And that works in our favor because now this is out of the way, but these teeth are really lean back. So it allows us room to upright the teeth into that position. So it gives us a good amount of room. So even though the teeth were like this initially and this moved out like this, now what we can do is do this for the lower. So we put the brackets on, we level aligned and torque. She's missing her second premolars. But what we did was then we placed the tads in that ideal location that we're talking about. And then those were the tads. So we placed two of them inside the palate. And what we did was that we attached a T-bar to it. So basically you have one tad here, one tad here, and the tad has a little cross through it like this. And then through that cross, what we did was is that we take that wire and I custom bend it across and I custom bend it like this. Initially, when I get it from the lab, it literally, it looks like a T. So all this bending that you see that's being done is all done chair side to adapt to the patient and to the tads themselves. So then what we did was, is that now the front teeth are anchored so that they cannot move. And so we're able to pull all the back teeth forward. So this way we don't lose any of that hard work that we did of getting the upper jaw forward. We're able to get it forward, but if we didn't put the tads there to hold the upper jaw and we put the power chain on, the upper teeth will get pulled back again. So the purpose of this tad is to make sure that we hold these teeth that we've developed forward like this, and we tad them so we hold it so they don't get sucked back again. So now we can pull them forward, put the tad on, and then now all the back teeth, we can pull them all forward towards it. And that's what you can see is what's happening here. So this is what we finished up with. That's a pre-treatment on the left. And then on the right, in the video, that's when she's been debonded. So you can see we finished with a really good result there. Um, and we we're able to upright the teeth so they're not as leaned back or retroclined.